an aerial view of a recently developed area in a remote area bordering Vietnam. It is a village in Kok Commune, Penye Krai District, Kampung Cham Province, and it was once a poor village with poor infrastructure. In recent years, the villagers could hardly produce as much rice as they do today. Due to the absence of a water irrigation system, they had to depend on rain to water their crops. But now, as a result of a development project by National Assembly President Samda Chen Samren, they can do rice farming twice or even three times a year. Before, we could farm rice only once a year, but after the development by some diet, we can do it twice, and some can do rice farming even three times per year. We are so happy to see enough water for farming, and there is even more fish than before. As there is enough water, we can produce more rice. Before, it was difficult to grow rice crop here due to water shortage. But now we can grow rice crop and it produces more yields. It is far different from before. Villagers also claimed their livelihoods have been improved as a result of the development. The development project began in May 2012 after years of postponement due to uncertainty over border demarcation with Vietnam. And as a result of the project, villagers have seen new model houses, roads, bridges, water irrigation system, school buildings, healthcare center, and a pagoda. The project was said to have benefited over a thousand households, and the villagers also want to see more development in other areas. I would like to thank Samlach Heizemren for the development that brings irrigation system and new houses for the villagers. We would be more than happy if he could expand the project to other villages. That's all in part one. When we come back, we will bring you more Latin news from the region and around the world. Stay tuned. ជាប្រតិការដល់ថុំបំផុតក្នុងតំបន់អាស៊ីអាគ្នេវាជាប្រតិការដែលតែងតែកើតឡើងរៀងរាល់ពីឆ្នាំម្ដងស៊ីគេ
We are people who are used to typhoon. We have lived with the typhoon already, but this is the first time where everybody was affected. So I believe everybody needs a, somebody to be able to talk to, to be able to open up and express their feelings. Because at the moment, they don't really, they were not able yet to process the whole experience. Maria Luz is among the four million people who lost their homes. She and her son are living in the church where they took refuge when the storm hit. Her way of coping is to volunteer and try to trace other survivors. After hearing the experiences from others who have lost their husbands or children, I realize that they've been through worse things than me. I feel lucky. Even if I nearly lost my son, he was returned to me, so I feel blessed. Some 7,000 people are thought dead or missing, and that toll is likely to rise. As the city of Tacloban counts its losses, the living have a long road of grieving ahead. President of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, Theodor Moran, visits Bosnia's mass grave from which 430 bodies have been uncovered so far. As officials continue uncovering bodies from Bosnia's largest mass grave, a well-known Holocaust survivor pays his respects. Theodore Marone, president of the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, says the site has a special significance for him. It is very difficult for me to speak at this place where one stands face to face with the horror that men can do to other men. Victims of ethnic cleansing were brought by trucks, unloaded and buried at the Tomaszice mass grave. 430 bodies have been exhumed since the site was discovered in August, 18 years after the Bosnian War ended. It's a painful reminder to those who lived through the country's dark past, such as this Bosnian man who believes that members of his family have been exhumed from the grave. There's a message I want to pass to Mr. Mayron on behalf of the victims from Priador. We are not satisfied with the work of the Hague Tribunal, with the severity of the punishments for the war crimes, and with the practice of the tribunal to release from prison those who have served two-thirds of their sentence. Around 1,200 people are still missing from the Priador area. An incredibly rare and near-complete diplodocus dinosaur skeleton that up in America is now on display and up for auction in the UK. It stands 17 meters long and just over 4 meters high. A rare Diplodocus dinosaur skeleton that was discovered in America is about to go up for auction in the UK. At 55 feet long and more than 14 feet high, it's one of only a handful of Diplodocus skeletons in the world that's about 50% complete, with the rest painstakingly replicated. Errol Fuller is the curator of the auction, which will take place at Summer's Place Auctions in Billingshurst. He says skeletons like this rarely come on the market as they're owned by museums. Such a thing in a reasonably complete state is very rare. I mean, and there's an awful lot of work that's gone into just preparing it, digging it out, out of the ground and, and consolidating all the bones and then assembling them into the form you see there. There's, there's hundreds, hundreds, thousands of hours of work gone into that. The estimated value is between $650,000 and $968,000, but auctioneers admit they don't really know what price tag to put on such a rare item. The fossil skeleton was discovered by a paleontologist in a quarry in Wyoming. Fuller explains that he was joined by his children on a dig and sent them to the quarry in an attempt to distract them. At the end of the day, they came back and they said, Dad, we, we found an enormous bone. So he immediately said, oh yeah, okay, I'll come and look, but do I have to, you know. And when he went and looked, there was this enormous, one of those enormous leg bones lying that they'd exposed, taken all day to expose, and he realized straight away that there was going to be a lot more there. And the rest is sort of up there. It took nine weeks for experts to dig the bones out of the ground, several months to prepare, and several more to assemble the metal frame in Holland. Fuller said he'd like to see the fossil end up in the Natural Museum of History in London, where a famous Diplodocus skeleton replica has stood in the main hall for more than a century. The auction will take place on November 27th. 
Mexico eyes the fashionable genius record as budding designers band together to stage the world's biggest urban fashion show with more than 3,000 amateur models. Mexican fashionistas want to get noticed, so they're putting themselves on the map or hoping a Guinness World Record will do it for them. Local designers teamed up with 3,000 models and attempted to stage the world's largest ever fashion show in Chapultepec Park. Event organizer Marie Rose Victoria. The first objective is to promote Mexican creativity. What we want is for the world to turn their eyes to Mexico and see all that can be done here. According to the National Chamber of the Apparel Industry in Mexico, some 20,000 businesses that make up the textile and fashion industry have had a rough time in recent years due to cheaper goods being imported. Participant Fabiola Hernandez says she hopes the diversity of the collections on the runway shows the world how much local talent there is to tap into. The show reflects the essence of people. There is some punk, something a little more preppy, but it's all mixed in with the personality of the people. Mexico's designers said they beat out a previous runway record set by the Philippines that featured over 2,000 models. Guinness officials have yet to certify the final count. And finally, we take a look at a beautiful house decorated with over 500,000 lights, setting a new genus world record for the most lights on a house. Ever wondered what your house might look like covered in half a million Christmas lights? Well, the Richards family found out. They draped 502,165 lights around their home in Australia, and in doing so, they set a new Guinness World Record for the most lights on a house. David Richards says setting it all up was just a little time consuming. It took me um, quite a while to, to set it up. I started in October. I took a week off in October school holidays and then have worked every weekend since. The electricity bill will certainly be higher in the following weeks, but Richards says a local power company is supporting his project. It's about another $2,500 per month for the month of December in power, but we're very fortunate in that ACTU AGL are sponsoring it with their green energy program, so it's doing something for nature as well. This isn't the first world record for the Richards family. They set the bar in 2011 when they strung up 331,038 fairy lights, but a New York family trumped that number in 2012. <laughs> That's all for today's program. Thank you for watching from Itana and the rest of this is Cambodia team. Good night.